I think uh, my starting point is that uh, what I've realized from my research since I left the service, and I'll come back to being inside the service, the nuclear weapons are power drugs to politicians, really. Uh, and the UK is especially keen to keep up with the big nuclear states. So the question is, how do you remove power from the politicians? Well, the politicians rely on votes. So as well as convincing and talking to international politicians, we really need to convince the voters, as much as the politicians, that nuclear weapons are not the comfort blanket, but perhaps perpetual propaganda of repetition and the phrase that you can sleep at night safely because, in our case, trying to keep you safe. And we need to get behind that statement for people to understand it. On a personal basis, I constantly point out, and this is where I came in from originally, was that every pound spent on nuclear weapons is a pound not spent on real military threats that we face today, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's a rogue state or whatever. We have got some real military threats. And do we have the right resources, conventional resources, to meet with them? Or is our nuclear threshold too low because we would go through the conventional assets so quickly? But it's not just military. There are, of course, threats to civil infrastructure, which we've seen in America and this country with hacking of uh, online companies. We need defenses against global warming, epidemics, famines, famines, and so on. So the, we really need education, education, education of the younger generation as to what the real cost is of spending all this money on nuclear weapons. There are better things and safer things to do. Next, I think, uh, despite the impact of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, I doubt that this in itself is going to cause an immediate change, although it will, of course, exert pressure. So if we're to have nuclear weapons for a while longer, sadly, and I strongly support the global no first use movement, which would radically reduce the risk of nuclear war in itself. And it's an important first step that I think will be easier to convince the general public about than immediate disarmament. But if you start to question one aspect of deterrence, nuclear deterrence, then actually the ground is being prepared for questioning the whole aspect of it, the logic. If you destroy the logic for one part, the apparent logic of it all starts to fall apart. Interestingly, when I was at sea in my Polaris submarine in 1972, quite a long time ago now, before we went on patrol, my captain and I had a discussion about would we press the button and it's interesting that a recent commander, Andrew Corbett, now retired, has said he wouldn't press the button for Boris Johnson under any circumstance. I do wonder if he won't press it for one, why he would press it for any. How do you do a character estimate if you're at sea? For instance, if the prime minister changes the lack of logic there. But it does indicate the power of just one person and the ridiculous situation where that person can actually issue a launch order without any third party to check up on it in the UK case. Anyway, my captain and I agreed that we were being paid to take Polaris to sea to respond to a fire order only if it was in retaliation for an incoming strike from the Russians. Under no circumstances would we wish to initiate a first strike, first use? And there were ways of checking up on that. The easiest was to listen to the BBC. And if there was no sign of any trouble or war or hostility or anything else, and the Radio 2 or Radio 4 were still transmitting the archers, then we might phone home and not, uh, and not fire. 
course, that then begs the question about if we had got an incoming strike, what was the benefit of firing back? And I have to say that amongst our brethren at sea, there was considerable doubt whether come the day the point of firing back actually had any point at all. It would be a form of revenge, really, that uh, if you're going to destroy the world, will we finish off the rest of the world? So the whole illogicality of it existed in my day, but we were pretty programmed to think of the Russians as a real enemy and that they would really fire. Since then, my research has shown that the Russians never had any intention of initiating a first strike, supported by quite a lot of evidence, but they were quite prepared to strike back if we struck first. So the whole thing has really been a nonsense. And actually, we also need to educate people that apparent threats are not always real threats. They are just noise. Possibly as noisy as Boris Johnson saying he'll raise the cap on nuclear weapons by another 80 warheads. We couldn't take another 80 warheads to see. There isn't space on the submarine to do that. So a lot of noise happens. So in the end, I come back to saying, and where I came in from on this, we just need to talk and inform and educate to get the right facts in front of the rising generation who perhaps we need to encourage to have a mindset similar to the days, early days of CMD and Green and Common when these issues were much more widely aired and talked about. I think uh, that, as I said at the beginning, that there is an enormous power conferred on people apparently or apparent power conferred by the ownership of nuclear weapons. And I think they feel that uh, Without them, they, they are not as strong as, say, Russia. So I can see that there is a fear that unilateral disarmament makes you look weak, and that is the biggest argument put up, say, for the UK, not going ahead with unilateral disarmament. It would make us look weak, as opposed to brave, by taking a step forward that would encourage others. I also think the military don't take a strong enough line because I think there is a real fear of the military that if they give up tritons, they won't get anything back in return. While the logic of saying 200 billion spent on tritons over the next, and um, nuclear weapons over the next 30 years would be better spent on frigates and submarines, which come in at a billion pounds downwards. So you could have a lot of submarines and ships for a billion pounds. The Navy is worried that actually you wouldn't get the money. It would just lose tritons. And trident actually is... Uh, pretty central to the Navy. A lot revolves around it, protecting it, getting it to sea. There's a pride of service, and to be honest, if you've got it and it operates very efficiently, you have to recognize that it's professionally run, albeit perhaps we don't need it. They do discharge their responsibility well. But it is central to the core of the Navy, along with carriers, two big roles. And they fear that if they lose what that role, they won't get anything to replace it if they leave a gaping hole in the Navy. So they don't push perhaps as hard as they might do. So there's absolutely no doubt at all that a doubt at all that uh, a nuclear war, exchange of nuclear weapons, will cause a significant effect on the environment. Uh, and if there was a full exchange, a significant exchange, it could well lead to um, uh, nuclear winter. So what the environmentalists are worried about could arrive in one fell swoop if there was an exchange of nuclear weapons. And I think, therefore, there is a strong case for bringing those two much closer together um, because they, are, they have got a common cause, whether it's, whether it's a, a making sure that meteorites don't strike us by advanced warning and perhaps some method of steering them away from the Earth, through to making sure that we as humans act more responsibly and don't contribute, 
And one of the ways must be that we don't ever think of launching a nuclear weapon, which would also accelerate it. So to me, that that is uh, that that is a logical link. 